Good evening, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome you to this evening's presentation. I'm Professor Barlow Dermogradichian of the Armenian Studies Program. Uh, this lecture and, and the presentations like it are part of what we call our Armenian Studies Program Fall Lecture Series, which is supported through the efforts of the Leon S. Peters Foundation. And all of our events this semester will be held as Zoom webinars. This evening, after uh, Dr. Kilichda's presentation, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. There should be a button that says Q&A, and you can write questions and ask questions, and I will be reading those questions for uh, Dr. Kilichda. Uh, this evening, I'd like to start off, however, by uh, sharing with you some of our upcoming events. So I'm going to share uh, the screen, and we're going to see a, a brief PowerPoint uh, which will be about the uh, Armenian Studies Program uh, upcoming events. Well, thank you. So we have some very interesting events uh, coming up and you can always find out about our events through the Armenian Studies Program website, which is at fresnostate.edu forward slash Armenian Studies or through our Facebook page and through other means. So we have a lot of uh, interesting events, as I, I said. Uh, professor Kilich Dai is the 17th Kazan Visiting Professor in Armenian Studies at Fresno State. And just recently he gave the first in a three-part series of lectures very fascinating talk about the question of conscription of the Armenians into the Ottoman army after the 1908 revolution. Uh, this evening, he is, his topic will be on subjects or citizens, Armenians from the Ottoman Empire to the Turkish Republic. But before I uh, sp speak more on the uh, topic, just want to remind you that he received his uh, doctorate uh, in 2014 with a dissertation called Socio-Political Reflections and expectations of the Ottoman Armenians after the 1908 revolution between hope and despair. Uh, and he has been uh, teaching at various universities at Istanbul's Bilgi University. He's also taught at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He's been a postdoc fellow at the Center for Mi Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard and was also a visiting professor at uh, Columbia University in the spring of 2020. Just as a reminder, he will be giving his third and final talk in the series on Monday, November the 16th, when he will speak about the question of uh, the Armenian patriarchal elections, and uh, in particular, the, the last election that took place in Istanbul for an Armenian uh, patriarch. This evening, his talk focuses on the question of how Armenians should be defined uh, under the new Turkish Republic, which was established in 1923, and uh, the talk will give us the types of questions that were being discussed about where to place the Armenians. Were they subjects as they were in the old Ottoman Empire or were they citizens in a new Turkish Republic as defined by the Luzon Treaty? So it's gonna be an interesting look into the question of identity for uh, the Armenians. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ohanes Kilichta to present his talk this evening. Yeah, uh, 
Thank you, Professor Dermigridician, for your kind introduction, and thank you uh, for uh, all your uh, all our participants who uh, join us this evening uh, for this talk. Uh, as you said uh, this evening, I'm going to talk about how Armenians uh, have been described, categorized, and treated by the Turkish Republic. Who, which supposedly is, was a new state uh, established after 1923. Uh, let me first try to share my screen and show you my presentation. Yeah, uh, yeah, I said uh, before uh, going into the body or the content of the presentation, uh, let me underline two notes. Uh, I said I'm going to talk about Armenians, how they uh, have been categorized, described, and treated by the Turkish state. Uh, and here, uh, when I say Armenians, I mean, uh, quote unquote, official Armenians, meaning that who were uh, registered and, uh, and living uh, as Armenians and at least as nominal Christians. Uh, I underline this because, uh, you know, also there is a group of people in Turkey who are defined as Islamized Armenians. Uh, and these Islamized, Islamized Armenians, I mean, in other words, or in more detail, who converted uh, to Islam during or after the genocide and their descendants still living uh, in Turkey is a different subject, related, but is a different subject. So uh, the issue or the topic of Islamized Armenians or that group then uh, is not covered uh, by my presentation today. So I feel the need first to underline this. When I mean Armenian again in this talk, I just mean, quote unquote, official Armenians living in, in Turkey. Another note, or the second note is that, although, I mean, uh, we said we, we are gonna look at how Armenians were categorized subject uh, and, and treated by the Turkish Republic, uh, what we say for Armenians is mostly valid and can be said for also other non-Muslim groups like Greeks, Jews, Assyrians, etc. Uh, so I can say that uh, Turkish state uh, does not have a minority policy just peculiar to Armenians or just covering Armenians, but indeed it's a part of uh, the general quote unquote minority policy of uh, Turkish Republic. As a matter of fact, uh, time to time I'm gonna refer, I'm gonna, or I'm gonna use the term Christians and Jews instead of Armenians, uh, because as I said, uh, indeed Armenians uh, were treated as a part of these non-Muslim groups or, or as one of these non-Muslim groups. Okay, after these notes, let's say, uh, let me uh, begin to my presentation. Uh, and then first, I want to give some numerical or statistical background of the issue. And I think these numbers also will speak for themselves indeed. And what you see now on the screen is the change in Christian and Jewish population in Turkey, uh, beginning from the late or the late Ottoman Empire in, in 1914. Uh, I'm not going to repeat uh, one by one each year, of course, but as you see, from 1914 to 1927, there was a dramatic uh, decrease drop. Uh, in Christian and Jewish population. Uh, in 1914, uh, they constituted more than 20% of the whole population, whereas in 1927, uh, they just constitute 2.5% 2%, uh, uh, of the whole population. Uh, I'm gonna tell more about these statistics, but uh, 
uh, let me explain why it stopped in 1965, because it's a quite old time. Uh, you know, these numbers uh, are taken from official censuses in, of Turkey. I mean, uh, carried out by uh, official Turkish uh, statistical institute. Uh, these statistics or this table stops in 1965 because after that date, uh, this institute of statistics uh, stopped publicizing uh, the answers of questions pertaining to mother tongue and religion because these numbers and percentages, uh, as I said, are inferred uh, from answers given to these questions of what is your mother tongue, what is your religion. So after 1965, uh, Turkish state, in other words, stopped publicizing this information. And quote unquote, they only shared this critical information with some strategic uh, institutions and strategic organizations. And even after 1985, they also stopped asking these questions in censuses, meaning that uh, by 1985, uh, in official censuses, uh, they have not asked what is the mother tongue or the religion of uh, people. Uh, I mean, the story behind uh, this change is another uh, implication or another indicator about Turkey, just very short, let me explain it. In 1985, uh, state security courts and the prosecutors of these courts uh, opened lawsuit against coordinators of these state institutes, institute of statistics and accused them of separatism, meaning that asking this kind of questions in a census related to mother tongue or religion, they assumed these kind of questions are separatism. Uh, uh, so after that date then, even they stopped asking this kind of questions in census. So today, indeed, we do not have, at least within our information, with, within our reach, we do not have any uh, official numbers about the ethno-religious composition of Turkey. Uh, therefore, it's very difficult to, for today, it's very difficult to say for sure how many Christians, how many uh, Jews, and how many Armenians related to it, how many Armenians uh, are still living in Turkey. Uh, but having said that, according to some, let's say, guesses, some uh, predictions, the number of citizen Christians and Jews today uh, in Turkey is something between 100,000 and 120,000. Uh, and since the total population of tu Turkey today is 84, 85 million, today the ratio of uh, Christians and Jews in Turkey is between 0.1 or 0.2 percent, okay? Uh, so meaning that this continuous uh, decrease from the initial years of Republic continued until this date, until uh, today. And now let me focus on Armenians and, and Armenian population more uh, in Turkey. Uh, actually, these are the only numbers, official numbers we have. And also these numbers also, uh, as you see, stopped in 1965 because of the same reasons just I explained. Uh, as I said, although these are, are the only official, official numbers, I'm not sure to what extent they are uh, reliable uh, because there are some confusion in these numbers or there are some, let's say, if you like, weird points, uh, which I am not able to explain. For example, as you see, the first row, uh, 
shows uh, the, the number of people who said that their mother tongue is Armenian. Uh, in 1927, in the first official census in Turkey, uh, this number is 64,000, as you see, 64,475. Uh, and more or less, more or less, it goes consistent. But, you know, as you see from 1960 to 1965, there was a sudden and huge drop in this number. Uh, as you see, uh, almost uh, 20,000 people whose mother tongue uh, was Armenian disappeared uh, from 1960 to 1965. And for me, uh, it's not uh, uh, explainable, let's say. I don't have any uh, explanation for this drop. Uh, but more or less, other than that, more or less this uh, mother tongue uh, issue is uh, numbers are consistent. Coming to religion, even it's at some points, it's more confusing. Please look at uh, the first two columns, 1927 and 1935. In that census, Armenianness or being Armenian is categorized as a religion, okay? Again, in 1927 and in 1935, being Armenian is defined, described as a religion rather than a nationality or ethnicity. But in 1935, they also have another categorization or another group, which is Gregorian. And this term, as uh, you may know, is used to denote or to describe the traditional Armenian apostolic church. So in only in 1935, they had both are being Armenian and be, being Gregorian as a category of religion. But after 1935, they stopped, uh, they stopped as, or categorizing Armenianness as a religion, but continued to use being Gregorian as a religion, okay? This is important because in a minute, I'm gonna talk about this Ottoman millet system and how in Ottoman millet system, uh, people were described, etc. So I think this 1927 and 1935 categorization uh, is a mark, still is a mark of Ottoman millet system. And indeed it shows uh, the confusion uh, uh, among uh, bureaucratic circles, among Turkish uh, state, since still Armenianness in 1927 and 1935 uh, were described as a religion, but not an ethnicity. Okay, but whatever, the, the solid, if you like, the solid uh, fact here is that still, in, both in terms of generally speaking, Christians and Jews, and more specifically about Armenians, there is a continuous drop. And for today, uh, again, because of the reasons I already mentioned, we do not have an official dependable uh, number of Armenians. Uh, official Armenians living in Turkey, but the guesses uh, differ between 60,000 and 70,000, but I think even 70,000 is a very uh, optimistic uh, guess. I can say that uh, most probably the number of Armenians today in Turkey is between 55,000 and, and 60,000, which means that, again, the considering the whole population of Turkey, they are less than 0.1%, 0, not 1%, I say 0.1% of whole uh, Turkish population. Uh, so again, uh, in a nutshell, maybe we can say that what we discuss here is today is maybe one of the most quote unquote successful ethno-religious demographic cleansing or homogenization of the 20th century. So I will try to explain or illustrate 
one of main strategy of Turkish state officials in doing this, in doing this homogenization of, let's say, uh, population. Uh, for this, let me focus uh, on the first two years of our table, meaning 1914 uh, and 1927. Uh, as you see, uh, the most dramatic decline was between those years. And I think which is not so surprising at all, if you consider that those 13 years contained the First World War, the Armenian Genocide, and the population exchange between Greece and Turkey, which was agreed in Lausanne, Lausanne Peace Conference in 1927. So after all these dramatic events, tragic events, uh, as you see uh, on the screen in the table, uh, generally speaking, uh, the population of Christians and Jews uh, dropped by almost 90% and Armenians population dropped by almost 94%, whereas the whole population of Turkey dropped by uh, 26%. So as you see, uh, the decrease in Armenian population is the most dramatic one because of, of course, uh, the genocide, etc. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, the population exchange between uh, Greece and Turkey. Let me uh, clarify or detail it with a few sentences. Uh, leaving all details aside, approximately 1.2 million Greeks were expelled from Anatolia, whereas approximately 400,000 Muslims were forced out of Greece. And this was, as you know, was an agreement between Greek and Turkish states. And during Lausanne Peace Conference, of course, Armenian population of Anatolia, I mean, including the Western and Eastern provinces, had already been annihilated, largely annihilated, or converted to Islam. Uh, however, Turkish delegate in Lausanne sought for the exchange of remaining Armenian population too, just like Greek population. You know, they decided or they agreed with Greece to exchange this population between states. Indeed, Turkish delegate in Lausanne aimed such kind of population exchange for also Armenians, for also remaining Armenians. But since they couldn't find a, an interlocutor to discuss this issue, uh, their will or their uh, aim couldn't be realized. Uh, and indeed, similarly, the, the aim or the purpose of Turkish delegate in Lausanne is, was also to expel Armenian patriarchate uh, from Turkey once and for all. But again, uh, they couldn't achieve this Armenian population exchange and exp uh, expulsion of Armenian patriarchate because they couldn't find any interlocutor to discuss this issue. I mean, for Greek uh, population exchange, there was this Greek government with which they discussed and agreed uh, population exchange, but they couldn't do, although they willed, they couldn't do the same thing for Armenian population. So, Whatever, despite all these declines, despite all these uh, peace conference, etc., uh, when the Republic of Turkey was declared, as you see, there were approximately still 300, uh, 360,000 Christians and Jews. And within this, there were almost, let's say, uh, 77,500 uh, 77, Armenians still living in Turkey. But let me say that these people, Christians and Jews, generally uh, Armenians specifically, uh, were not uh, distributed evenly to whole country, to uh, across the country, let's say across Turkey, but 
69% of these Christians and Jews were living in a single city, which was, as you may guess, is Istanbul. Uh, so in 1927, 31% of the Istanbul population was either Christian or Jewish. So Istanbul was a demographic outlier compared to the rest of the country. And still today, when we say indeed Armenians of Turkey, actually, in fact, we mean Armenians in Istanbul because except maybe a few hundred, maybe less, uh, almost all Armenians today in Turkey are living in Istanbul. So again, indeed the term Turkish or Armenians uh, living in Turkey is not so meaningful because uh, factually, eventually most of the Armenians in Turkey today are living in Istanbul. So we are indeed talking about Armenian community of Istanbul rather than of, of Turkey. So whatever, as we said, uh, in the beginning of Republic, there were 600, uh, 300, sorry, 360,000 Christians and Jews living in Turkey. Now the question Turkish nation state faced of what they would do with these people. How would they describe, categorize, and treat these people? Okay. They had to decide this issue. They had to settle this issue. And as a possible answer to this question of how they would describe and treat these people, indeed, there, if you like, there are uh, three possibilities or three ways of describing these people and treating them. One is the Ottoman millet system. The other is the law of citizenship. And the other source, if you like, or reference point is the Lausanne Treaty or the related articles of Lausanne Treaty, articles between 37 and, and 45. These articles, stipulated uh, how Turkish state uh, is supposed to treat these people. I mean, generally speaking, non-Muslim non -Muslim minorities and more specifically, Armenians. I mean, each of these three points or three sources, uh, reference sources is a long and complicated issue in itself. However, let me try to put some defining characteristics of each of them. And so we can make a comparison between these different ways of defining subjects or defining uh, people and treating them. So the Ottoman millet system, very, again, shortly speaking, uh, in the Ottoman millet system, as I uh, listed uh, in, in my slide, uh, in the Ottoman millet system, public authority, uh, divided people under its rule into categories based on religious identities. To put the same thing differently, each individual was treated according to his uh, membership to that particular religion, okay? In other words, public authority was not blind to primordial identities of the people, okay? Rights and responsibilities of each individual was specified by his membership to a cer certain religious group, okay? So in other words, individuals uh, was not perceived as atomistic or autonomous, uh, entities, but as a part of religious groups. On the other end, these religious groups were given some collective, if you like, group rights in their civil affairs and in family law, such as 
issues related to marriage, inheritance, divorce, also in cultural matters. And they, in other words, they had an autonomy in cultural and educational matters. This was also a part of uh, millet system, okay, a characteristic of millet system. So in this model, if you like, uh, model of millet system, public authority did not, as I say, perceive people as autonomous ones, but as a part of religious communities. And in this model, group leaders who were mostly uh, religious figures, cleric figures, these group leaders were expected to organize the internal, uh, let's say, affairs of communities. Uh, these group leaders played the role of mediator between their people and public authority. authority. So state uh, accepted group leaders as primary interlocutors, okay? Uh, these group leaders were responsible of keeping order within their group, as I said, and, and, and you know, for example, they had some critical functions like collecting some taxes. I mean, collecting taxes from their people, from their flock and transmit this sum to the state. As a matter of fact, Armenian Patriarchate in 19th century, especially uh, functioned as a tax collector, okay, from Armenians to transmit, to transfer this money to the state, for example, okay. Uh, so then there was a mediation of religious figures between people and state. Coming, coming to uh, modern law of citizenship, indeed the philosophy uh, of modern citizenship is quite opposite of this, as you know. Uh, in modern citizenship model, public authority treats each individual equally, or at least theoretically speaking, public authority treats each people uh, equally, meaning regardless of his membership or his ident religious identity, ethnic identity, or whatever, the, any collective identity. So public authority, authority in citizenship law accepts each individual just as an individual, okay? Uh, and equal individuals. Uh, so moreover, in modern law of citizenship, public authority state tries to eliminate any kind of religious or collective mediation between itself and citizens. In other words, uh, in this law, in this law of citizenship, state and citizen is supposed to be in one-to-one -one relation, okay, without any mediator without any, uh, uh, let's say, uh, connector between state and citizen. So everybody is supposed, every individual is supposed to be equal in front of the law. Okay. So coming to uh, Lausanne Treaty, what Lausanne Treaty stipulated for non-Muslim quote unquote minorities, including Armenians, First of all, Lausanne Treaty uh, guaranteed the equal treatment of Christians and Jews with Muslims, okay? Uh, but moreover, or beyond this promise, if you like, or guarantee of equality, it also stipulated or, or recognized, let's say, some positive rights for these people, for Christians and Jews, and of course, Armenians, to preserve their identity and culture. Uh, and in this treatment, in these articles, related articles, Turkish state uh, agreed that 
it would provide or it would facilitate the development and maintenance of cultural and educational foundations of these people, okay, uh, including Armenians, of course. Uh, and Article 42, beyond all these promises, uh, Article 42 of the Lausanne Treaty indeed reminded the millet system because according to this article, Armenians, besides other groups, would be able to organize their uh, internal, some of their internal issues like family law, like civil law, according to their own traditions. So Article 42 of Lausanne uh, indeed recognized this group right, if you like, of Armenians. Uh, as I said, also this uh, in this art or in this uh, tre treaty, uh, Turkish state accepted to provide an environment and atmosphere in which cultural and educational foundations, organizations of Armenians would live freely and develop uh, freely. Now, the question is, which one of these ways or these legal bodies, if you like, legal references has been applied by Turkey in its treatment of Armenians? As you see, the answer is none and all at the same time. Turkish authorities, Turkish public authorities have not applied any of these ways, any of these sources, reference sources consistently. But if you like, we can say they shifted from one to another to weaken the economic and social grounds of Christians and Jewish communities, okay? Uh, moreover, Turkish public authority or Turkish state largely ignored the stipulations or articles of Lausanne Treaty and positive rights or group rights given to, uh, to Armenians in this treaty. Uh, let us focus on the leg legacy of Millet system in Turkish Republic. I mean, whether Turkish Republic recognized and continued Ottoman Millet system or not. Indeed, Turkey has not promulgated any law that inherits the millet system. It has never officially ratified or recognized this system. For example, as some of you uh, may know, uh, in 1863, there was an Ottoman, uh, I mean, there was an Armenian constitution uh, which organized internal affairs, uh, internal administrative, uh, let's say, educational affairs of uh, Armenian community of Ottoman Empire. For example, Turkish state has not recognized this constitution or regulation as, as a part of its legal body, okay? Or any other uh, codification promulgated in Ottoman Empire, uh, were inherited uh, from inherited to Turkish Republic. So, uh, and but in this sense, legally speaking, formally speaking, Turkey did not inherit Ottoman millet system because, as I said, there is nothing in its legal body related to this. But when we look at the practice. Uh, in some of their practices and policies, they have preserved the mentality of millet system. For example, uh, although today there is no law, bylaw, or any other codification uh, describing the status of Armenian patriarchate, but still, de facto speaking, Armenian patriarch is still accepted as the representative of community. 
I mean politicians, state officials, bureaucrats uh, meet with patriarch to discuss the problems or issues of Armenian community. But legally speaking, Armenian patriarchate and Armenian patriarch uh, do not have any legal existence. And on the paper, there is no difference between myself, for example, and Armenian patriarch, legally speaking. But de facto, as I say, uh, they are still accepted as uh, the, the representative of Armenian community. So there is this kind of inconsistency, if you like, uh, with the legal uh, definition or the legal situation and the de facto uh, situation. Uh, let me give another example to show this inconsistency in, in, the pol in the Turkish policies. And this is, if you like, a historical uh, example, which is the capital tax, which is called Varlık Vergisi in Turkish. Uh, it was valid uh, between November 1942 and March 1944. Uh, ostensibly, this was a tax that targeted those people who became rich through black marketing in war conditions. As you know, this was a time of Second World War uh, going on. And as I said, the official reason of promulgating this tax or levying this, this tax was uh, to, if you like, quote unquote, punish these uh, people who got rich by black marketing uh, in war conditions. But in practice, it was used to weaken the economic base of Armenians and let's say other non-Muslim groups. Uh, very shortly speaking, the tax amounts were specified very arbitrarily and some people couldn't pay the tax even if they sold all their properties. I mean, imagine a tax which you are not able to pay even if you sell all your properties, movable and immovable, okay? And those who couldn't pay the tax uh, were sent to labor camps uh, uh, at this time. So let me relay you an anecdote, uh, which I think uh, clearly expressed this inconsistency of Turkish policies uh, pertaining to these non-Muslim groups, including Armenians. No, when it was heard that the government would impose such a tax on Christians and Jewish uh, communities, uh, these communities formed a delegation and visited the prime minister of the time, Shukru Sarajolu, and they asked how much the government needed. And they proposed to collect that money, to collect that sum, uh, within themselves, by themselves, and submit it as a lump sum to the government, okay? So here the critical thing is that this proposal reminded the logic of millet system. Because remember that I said in millet system, communal leaders were acting as a mediator between state and uh, their people. So what the, these delegates proposed uh, indeed reminded that logic. However, the prime minister rejected uh, this proposal and replied that they are a state, meaning that they are a modern state. Uh, and by this, he meant to be a modern state which deals with its own citizens directly without any mediation, okay? So by this logic, at least discursively, the Turkish government rejected this proposal. But when we look at how they implied, how they, let's say, carried out this tax, 
we see that although the prime minister rejected mediation, at the end, in the, in the uh, implication of this tax, in implementation of this tax, they followed a certain uh, mentality of millet system because as you see on the screen, uh, they described people and divided people into four groups, okay? When they, when they specified who would pay how much money, okay? And four groups of taxpayers were specified as Muslims, non-Muslims, aliens, and converts. And converts here uh, referred to people who or their ancestors converted to Islam from Judaism or, or Christianity, but largely Judaism. And in distributing tax, there was a huge dramatic, uh, let's say imbalance between these groups or injustice, if you like, between these groups as for example, non-Muslims who constituted less than 2% of the population were supposed to pay 87% of the whole sum, okay? So in other words, they categorized people into different groups and treated them hugely unequally. Uh, and as, as I say, taxpayers were not allowed to object the tax levied on them and given two weeks to pay this tax. And as I said, uh, the properties of those who couldn't pay in two weeks were garnished. And if even the properties did not match the whole amount, that person was sent to labor camps. So shortly speaking, on the one hand, the government rejected the proposal reminding the millet system, but on the other hand, it followed a way which itself reminded the millet system since they categorized people according to their religion and they treated them unequally uh, when they distribute the tax. In other words, they officially, discursively, they rejected the mentality of millet system, but they did not apply the law of equal citizenship either. Uh, as for Lozantrit, as I already said before, the Turkish state has largely ignored, moreover violated its clauses, its articles. Uh, for example, leaving aside facilitating the development of institutions of these communities, uh, even they confiscated properties of Armenian institutions, Armenian, let's say, endowments uh, or, or foundations, okay? It, this is a long issue within itself, but let me say that, uh, again, uh, Turkish state have not facilitated the improvement, the development of Armenian organizations, Armenian uh, schools, endowments, pious foundation, etc. But on the contrary, they confiscated properties of, of uh, uh, Armenian institutions. So uh, just let me underline an irony before finishing my uh, talk. Uh, this is an irony in the treatment of Armenians by Turkish state. You know, whenever state officials encountered any demands to preserve the identity and existence of Armenians, they replied that this would be contrary to equality and secularism, since they claimed in a secular political order, order people cannot be given privileges according to their religious identities. In other words, they claimed that they already provided equal rights for every single individual, which is not actually true, true but they say, therefore, there is no need some extra or group right, extra rights for any group, okay? 
For example, they have rejected to promulgate any law for patriarchates to describe the po position or the state status of patriarchate on the ground that secular state, a secular state does not deal with such things. However, there has been a directorate of religious affairs since mid 1920s. It's a, it's, it was a quite old institution. And this directorate of religious affairs takes a large sh share from governmental budget, but it works only for Sunni Muslims. Okay, so again, this is another inconsistency in Turkish policy toward religion and religious groups. So let me finish by saying this. The state, Turkish state, has created a deliberate legal vacuum and administrative ambiguity in defining and treating Armenians. And in this way, they could act arbitrarily, which has facilitated the, the demise of Armenians as one of the non-Muslim communities of the empire. In other words, this legal vacuum and administrative uh, let's say uh, ambiguity provided a flexible uh, environment for Turkish authorities to treat Armenians uh, in accordance with the existing conditions. So they shifted from one policy to another uh, and, and to weaken the social fabric of let's say Armenians and, and other non-Muslim communities. So let me stop here. Thank you for your patience. Uh, it I would like to answer if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Kilicta. Um, let's, uh, we can maybe un, uh, unshare the screen. That way we can talk sure. a little bit and then so if you would like to ask a question, please use the uh, question and answer uh, function. And then I will be reading some of the questions. And while you're doing that, I, I kind of had a question, which maybe is a continuation of mm -hmm. what you talked about in terms of this, uh, this purported idea of not categorizing people. But is it true that uh, a few years ago that it was discovered that uh, the Turkish government was using special codes in the passports to categorize uh, certain communities, and what yeah, was yeah. The, what was the purpose of that, or purported purpose of that? You know, I said after 1985, they stopped asking these questions pertaining to mother tongue and religion. But it seems that they have had their own ways to follow and to register people, and this quote unquote secret code on passports. Uh, seems is one of these ways uh, to follow, uh, to observe, if you like, these non-Muslim uh, communities. And, uh, you know, there is no doubt because in, a, in an official letter, uh, I don't remember exactly from where to where, but in an official governmental letter, they mentioned themselves, these codes, the, the existence, the presence of these codes. So I think uh, it is true. Uh, and as I said, although they stopped asking formal questions about ethno-religious identities, but they have their own records, they have their own ways to follow people. And and I just want to follow up and say, I, I, I would think that that would also mean that they could use discriminatory practices right in other words yeah, sure in sure. hiring I mean, let's say they're gonna they're gonna look at your passport and say oh you're you're so and so and you may discriminate against you uh and you know what as i said islamized armenians is out of scope of this talk but let me say related to to them at this point even they follow the converts for generations you know for example one people one person may learn that his ancestors or one of his ancestors uh, was Armenian if he applies 
any job, any critical, any strategic job, for example, in military, okay? We know there are some examples of, of this situation. For example, as I said, a certain person applies for a job in military, but he is rejected, apparently without any reason. But later he learned that he was rejected because there was a convert, Armenian convert in his ancestors, in his previous generations. So what I'm trying to say is that they follow not only official Armenians and other non-Muslims, they also follow this line of conversion, okay, until this day, through their, of course, through their state records. And actually, that's uh, one of the questions which was asked, which, but I think you mm. partially answered it, is mm. were mm. people who converted allowed to participate in government or in official functions, official positions? I mean, for example, I mean, let me say that they may they made teachers, for example, at public schools. I don't know, I mean, I just, I'm making it up, but you know, uh, for critical posts in bureaucracy, uh, it will be very difficult for them to have these posts. Uh, yeah, I mean, they have, let's say, uh, lower rank positions in bureaucracy, uh, in educational, maybe uh, bureaucracy, but other than that, it would be difficult for them, for converts to have critical posts in uh, civil or military bureaucracy. And, and I, I wanted to ask you also, because it seems like it, when you talk about, when you talk about the Treaty of Lausanne and mm -hmm. its purported use, in other words, the government had signed the Treaty of Lausanne Mm -hmm. And but we know, for instance, that they have they have closed uh, Armenian seminaries in Turkey for many years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, but I just want to ask then: there is no really recourse on the part of the uh, Armenians. They have to actually then go back to the Turkish government to seek recourse for that. And so yeah. they can pick and choose which law they want to apply. In other words, yeah, that's that's the whole point. You know, they decided according to that conjunct conjuncture they decided to treat people, Armenians, in accordance with Ottoman military system uh, mentality, or they will treat them as individuals and they, let's say, uh, underline secularism and equality in treating. In other words, when these principles of equality and secularism work for, uh, to the detriment of Armenian identity, they underline this secularism and secularism and equality, okay? But normally, let's say, they do not follow these principles in treating people, in describing and categorizing people. And that policy has been, it doesn't really matter what government there is or what political yeah, party. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is, a, this is a good point. I'm not talking about here, peculiar to a certain political party, left wing or right wing, I'm talking about here consistent state policy. And uh, in fact, it has not differed whether this party or that party is in power in Turkey. Yeah, this is a good point. It's not related. It's not something related to party politics. Okay, we're still waiting for some questions. So I'm gonna keep asking sure. a couple more questions and sure, then we'll sure. see where we go. But uh, you mentioned about the status the status of the patriarchate. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know you'll probably will discuss it in, in light of the elections, but I think it also ties in here. Uh, so was the, the patriarchate as a official position recognized in anything in the Treaty of Lausanne or was it simply, at what point did its status change and to what is it? To what yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. In 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 Lausanne, uh, it is recognized, but in Turkish legal body, I'm saying Republican uh, Turkish uh, legal body, there is no legal codification, any legal document uh, mm -hmm. describing the status of the patriarchate or let's say 
describing its rights and responsibilities, etc. Uh, so, you know, as my third talk will be uh, more specifically about uh, patriarchate. Uh, and in that third talk, I'm going to try to explain these issues in more detail, let's say. Okay. I mean, related to Armenian patriarchate. Okay. Let's see. Um, is it true that names of con converts include the word Olu as a as a ending on a name? Uh, I mean, we cannot say this for everyone, uh, but just rather than Olu, maybe this is true. But for by, by example, for example, not only Armenians, for also some Kurdish people, because you know, in 1934, this uh, surname law was promulgated and every family was given uh, a certain surname. Uh, and you know, some surnames which containing the word Turk, Turkolu, Turker, Yilmaz Turk, etc. So this kind of uh, surnames, uh, not as a rule, but generally speaking, uh, were given to non-Turk people including Kurds. So, so today, some Kurds uh, uh, in Turkey uh, carry surnames which contains the word or the term Turk, Turk. So this is, is, this is an issue, not only for Armenians, but uh, related to general assimilationist policy of Turkish state. But again, it kind of points out that even though they passed that law, and, and wanted to change the last name, it didn't really change the way they were seen by the government because- Yeah, exactly. <laughs> actually exactly. still being seen as separate than the- than, than a, I mean, especially, I mean, especially Armenians and other, let's say non-Muslims, because as for Kurds, they always hoped that one day Kurds would be assimilated to Turkishness, uh, but for Armenians and other, Christians and Jewish populations, uh, rather than assimilation, let's say, I mean, they did not uh, exclude assimilation completely, but rather than assimilation, I can say that their primary aim was to lessen the number of these people and actually which they have achieved. And so do they keep, but they, but they do keep uh, the statistics on Kurds, correct? Or, or, I mean, even though in the popular, they may have called them, you know, mountain Turks or something, but they, uh, the government does keep a statistic on, on Kurds, for instance. Uh, you know, again, because of the same reasons, uh, officially today, it's not possible to say how many Kurds are living in Turkey. Uh, but most probably, uh, again, the state uh, may keep some records somewhere, but again, officially, as far as I know, there is no such certain number about the existence or the presence of Kurdish population in, in Turkey. And, and it doesn't enter into this uh, modern political discourse, even among Turkish political parties. They're, they're not discussing this issue. It's not, a, it's not an issue that needs to be discussed. It's already a settled, a settled policy of the state. Which issue you mean? Which the issue policy? Of, of this, the question of, uh, of, uh, of citizenship and status. Hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean it's nothing, nobody's uh, contesting. I mean, let's say the Kurdish parties may contest it, have they? Uh, have, mm, mm. have the Kurdish political parties contested? I mean, Kurdish political parties, uh, I may say that have have been more sensible, if you like, uh, toward these issues, uh, toward these uh, <clears throat> religion, <clears throat> sorry, uh, rights or group rights of people and cultural rights of people. But other than that, you are right. Uh, generally speaking, it it is not an issue in. Turkish political life, okay, uh, except, let's say, Kurdish political parties. Okay, I don't see any other questions. If there is, uh, please go ahead and write it now. Otherwise, we're going to kind of co conclude today's session. 
I uh, don't see any other open uh, questions. So Dr. Kilichta, thank you for your uh, presentation this evening. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you for accepting me again. He, he will be speaking on Monday, uh, November the 16th at seven o'clock California time. And the topic is a very fascinating and a contemporary talk, topic, which is dealing with the um, situation of the Armenian Patriarchate in Istanbul and the recent elections uh, for that Patriarchate and the crisis that it caused both within the Armenian community and between the Armenian community and the, and the government. So thank you again and good night everyone.